Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea and other miscellaneous actions, I suppose. And this week, we are going to be reviewing two new albums from two artists. We are going to be talking about the new album from famed guitarist extraordinaire Jack White's new album, Fear of the dawn and we're also going to be talking about the new album from uh, god there's no real broad category i can really give to him other than father john misty's new album chloe and the new 20th century also this week on the channel we have the newest episode in our bjork retrospective homogenic the big one the first truly really uh, heavy hitter we're talking about this is i guess the the if we're going to do an equivalent this is like the the okay computer episode of the radiohead retrospective soon to be followed by its respective kid a with vespertine so look what? out for that on the horizon absolutely yeah no that was a really that great was a, discussion that was a really fun one to record and and yeah so the Bjork retrospective seems to continue seems to be continuing to do really really well so I think we've had got had a few new subscribers who've joined just for that as well so if you're watch having to watch one of our new episodes thank you for sticking around hope you enjoy what we do uh, we will be hitting you with the Vesperteen video in just under a couple of weeks. But today, mm -hmm. as Jake said, we're going to talk about some new records. But before we do that, let's get into our, as we normally do, our what we've been listening to segment, where we talk about records that we have been listening to in the last seven days that we think are interesting, worth talking about, worth mentioning. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, it's not completely obvious just because my background is not like super distinct or anything, but I have been in the process of moving for the past two weeks. So I have been listening to a hell of a lot of ambient music. I don't really know why that was like an immediate like kick for me, but it just kind of like coincided. And I was just, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to some stuff I've had on the back catalog. So I've been listening to a lot, a lot of Ski Mask, uh, an artist that uh, Riley recommended uh, a while ago, specifically the album Compro, um, which I am here to say is like a modern IDM classic in the making. It is a fucking terrific record. Um, really, really like, it really caught me off guard. Like it's, it's really an album that's almost disarming and how like the first three tracks are like, this is really good you know, substantial meat and potatoes IDM. And then the rest of the album just gets gradually weirder. Uh, and I really, really love that about it. It's incredibly dynamic, incredibly fun. Um, I also listened to Ski Mask's album Pool, uh, which came after that, which is a longer kind of more sprawling record. It's like a almost a, a celebration of IDM as a genre, really, just because it's so diverse. It's a really cool album, um, and I really enjoy that record, but I actually do think that Compro, the comparatively overlooked album, uh, is the is the better one. It's the more concise one, uh, in my opinion, but, like, I would put that up there with, you know, modern Autecker in terms of, like, actual quality and yeah. substantial uh and <laughs> sorry august's cat wrangling it's just he's, he's so lively <laughs> i i'm very validated that you've gotten super so into this art it's really easy i mean i just really easy i think i mentioned a couple of weeks ago like it's really easy just to loop his records just to put them on while i'm doing something oh, a lot yeah. of the time it's playing a video game and just let that sort of become an ambient soundscape one of the things i really like about uh, what Ski Mask does is he's re I love the way he uses like reverb and silence and just like yeah, really yes. sort of subtle low key aesthetic tonalities that he, and he yeah, he finds ways to make them really creative and, and interesting and cut them up and 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 just create these very sort of light soundscapes. Uh, I like to think of Ski Mask music as like ambient house where it's like it's like mm -hmm. ghostly sort of shards of house music infused with IDM, but also so low key that it's never really all that intrusive. I I, I love mm -hmm. that. I'm, I'm so glad you're, you're digging the shit. I, I had a feeling you would, so very validating. Yes. Right. And on the total opposite end of the spectrum in terms of like musical appeal, I gave a listen to an album from a metal band I've been meaning to check out for a really long time just because they seem to occupy my metal sensibilities uh, and they have several canonical classic records that I just 
haven't heard before. Uh, and I started with their final records, bit of a sort of a reunion album-ish kind of thing, but I listened to Monotheist by Celtic Frost. Uh, I know this is a favorite metal album of our friend Pokey Jam. Uh, easy to see why. This is an ass kicker of an album. This, this album is fucking evil. Like, there are some times where the guitar tones on this, you know, they're like, they're pure, like, Ozzy era Sabbath and kind of growling and gnarled. And then other times they just sound like a fucking monster. You kind of got to get over the fact that the lead singer is... At oh yeah, I the caveman. The is, his accent is, shall we say, pronounced. So it is a bit of a thing you have to get over. Yeah. But that being said, once you kind of settle into that groove, this is some astonishing blackened doom metal. Uh, and with kind of a gothic edge to it, it's really like a kind of bizarrely accessible combination of a lot of really inaccessible parts of metal. Um, the records, like, you know, 50 minutes sounds like a lot, but with the way the album is paced, it actually flies by pretty damn quickly. Uh, and it's another album that, uh, uh, funnily enough, like Compro, that like the first couple tracks are very standard, but very solid stuff. And then the album just kind of gets weirder and more ambitious oh, as it goes yeah. along. And I really enjoyed that shit. Um, Jake, I'm really going to be looking into their back catalog. You have, If you want uh, Celtic Frost being weird, you have to listen to Into the Pandemonium. That okay. is a metal record with, I shit you not, a new wave cover, an opera singer, and uh, spoken word poetry. Well, You know, that's the thing. When looking at um, their discography on Rate Your Music, I saw their genre tags, and I was like, glam metal? What? And it oh, turns that's, out that yes. this band has done a whole lot of things. I mean, to limited degrees of success from what it seems like, but they are a, a band cold of many Frost. different They're, uh, Cold Frost is an album of theirs that is infamous in metal circles for like mm. wrecking their career because it was so bad. It, it, uh, it does not inspire uh, confidence. I'm already intrigued by just this band's like seeming tastelessness. Like I, I'm a huge proponent. I, I really appreciate when bands just kind of like abandon taste, even if it doesn't mm. always work out. Um, so this is very intriguing to me. They are yeah, an, and like, an interesting They're group. so like fucking, like they're so committed on shit like monotheist. And even so I've heard a little bit of uh to Megatherian, which those are albums that are just so rooted in their influences and genres that you just really wouldn't expect them to do much different with their career. So on one level, I kind of respect it. So I, I appreciate that the front man is named Tom G. Warrior. Thomas G. Warrior. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's an, if that's not a metal oh. ass name, I don't know what is. Oh, that's fucking terrific. I love that. Jonathan yeah, F. Uh, Satan. <laughs> In corpse grinder ass name. Or what is it? Lord Worm. Lord Metal Worm. Uh, one band I have been getting into that I seemingly was a bit uh, well-timed was uh, I'm finally listening to Built to Spill. Um, an album that has been mentioned by them is I think uh, Morgan was how I first came across them because he talked about um, listening to Keep It Like a Secret a long time ago. And then I was like, boy, uh, the way they're talking about this, I really should listen to this band. And I did. I listened to two albums by Built to Spill uh, this week. And one of them is uh, not Keep It Like a Secret, but uh, the other sort of like huge uh, canon album uh, that they have, uh, which is called fucking perfect from now on. Perfect from now on. Thank you. Um, which I sort of cheekily, but also semi seriously commented on Twitter that this is a band that's like if Elliot Smith fronted Alice in Chains, <laughs> and you know I. I kind of stick by it, frankly. There, there's like the these these guitar tones and the tonality of the singer's voice, uh, especially on some of those albums on 
or some of those songs like on Perfect From Now On, it's it, that melding of indie rock sensibilities and um, sort of a harder, like really guitar driven edge, which I mean, that was sort of the selling point that you all said they were just like, do you like the sound of the guitar? Uh, and yeah, I do. And this band is really good at, at using that. I really enjoyed that album. Um, I mean, easy to see why it's a classic. I really like the songwriting, kind of a slacker rock-ish vibe. I was reminded a little bit of Pavement at points. Um, Absolutely. It's just a lot of really good shit. Um, but the album I really want to talk about is the album I listened to, them, uh, listened to first, which is 2009's There Is No Enemy. And honestly, of the two I've listened to, I kind of prefer this one. Um, which is weird because it's weirder and more post-rock influenced. But something about the songwriting on here and just the overall atmosphere that the instruments create, something about it just kind of appealed to me more. And that was the one that I was really eager to go back and revisit a little bit more. So I've got a bunch of more albums of theirs that I want to listen to, but that's a really good album. And I really feel like, you know, um, not that I'm well-versed in this band and what people think of them, but they seem to be a band that's sort of like those first uh, three, four records are the ones that people hold in really high esteem. And then the rest of the ones are just kind of, or whatever. Well, but There Is No Enemy is sort of a more enveloping atmospheric listen, but it doesn't abandon uh, their sort of songwriting sensibilities, which I think are really, really strong here. Um, just a really underappreciated album in their catalog. So if you're ever like, you know, just give it a shot. If you've never listened to it before, or maybe you've, uh, uh, listen to it and not thought much of it in the past because I personally really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, Built to Spill are one of those bands that while they had a kind of a, a peak in their moment in the late 90s around the time where this kind of indie rock was was really big, and I think Pavement's probably the best comparison I could come up with in terms of how similar they are, but Built to Spill have always had the edge for me and I think for a lot of people because of how kind of jammy and really sort of like intricate and huge they can get with their guitar arrangements like they're very much an indie mm -hmm. rock band and you can hear in their records kind of the limits of being an indie rock band like it's when they do get really really ambitious like the the records still tend to be quite lo-fi and kind of like mm -hmm. um you know, recorder on a modest budget, but they just kind of have the, a certain level of ambition and jamminess that kind of rises them above. And also kind of their whole grimier sonic aesthetic, I think enhances a lot of what they do. Like the thing about Perfect From Now On for me is that's a record that's just dominated by like these really kind of like watery, murky, but like incredibly powerful guitar tones. Like it, it's, it's so oh, yeah. like, just, it's a thick, pool of guitar tones all over that record um that's why it reminds me of alice in chains really reminds me of that guitar playing it reminds me of jerry cantrell on jar of flies absolutely i think it's a super solid comparison and um I, I think you might even be surprised by how kind of different keep it like a secret is from that although there's certainly recognizably the same band um but i'll just mm -hmm. say like if i were to recommend one record to you that's a little bit kind of left of the dial is i think you'd really dig you in reverse which is sort oh, of okay. uh, the record they made right before There Is No Enemy. And um, I think one of their more underrated records, it has, it, it's a much kind of more kind of uh, slower, but still quite jammy album that I think is really, really easy to sort of just get lost in. And it has a lot of those amazing guitar tones as well. And it also opens with one of their absolute best songs. So I think you really dig that, but um true bts fans know they never fell off the real um, bts true true bts fans know they never fell off and i'm glad jake that you're you're actually like discovering that by just diving into some of the later period stuff which is really underrated i also listened to this has been a long time coming just because this is like such a jake core band and sound and we've compared uh, a lot of things to them uh, and that being, I finally listened to my first album from Dead Can Dance. I listened to Within the Realm of the Dying Sun, which is like, if you don't know Dead Can Dance, they're sort of the definitive kind of goth rock, neoclassical dark wave wow. band. And God help me. Yeah, this was a fucking heater. This was something that like, it really kind of caught me off guard, honestly, just because of how, like, I listened to the remaster and I'm, that probably has something to do with it. But 
my God, does this album sound good. It's a lot of these really intricate, vast, sweeping orchestral arrangements that, you know, they, they, they sound so inherently cinematic and there's a certain amount of heft and camp to these vocal performances that this is kind of like the midway point between like the cure, like right in the middle of disintegration mixed with, God, I don't know, like it's indescribable, honestly. Like there's there's just nothing quite like, I mean, there's some like post-punk acts like the cure or even like Bauhaus, I actually think is probably a better comparison, but even then they don't have the size and the sort of baroqueness that their sound invokes. Um, again, if you really like the Lingua Ignata album from last year, or if you just like Lingua Ignata in general, this is sort of the only thing I've listened to since listening to Kristen music um, that has ever evoked exactly that kind of unknowable, supernatural feeling. Like I can only describe um, within the realm of the dying sun as being like staring at a, like an insanely large painting by Hieronymus Bosch which if you don't know him, he did, he's really famous for all of his paintings of, uh, his depictions of hell, where there's just like all of this insane, crazy, like chaos and geometrical fucking Salvador Dali nonsense. That's what this album sounds like. Uh, and it's fucking ridiculous. Like they have apparently just a, a litany of great records that I'm totally hyped to look into now D dead can dance are like one of the most in my mind one of the most jake core bands like that i just assume that you know them because they're just so they they just I, I think about them and they're just so your aesthetic um just yeah. the whole the whole thing i i like to think of lisa girard the female vocalist in this band as being like a the kind of like tethered version of hope sandoval from mazzy star like it's just kind of evil <laughs> Uh, evil woman who yeah. who you, you has this dreaminess to the way that she sings that's just like really striking and kind of hypnotic almost um she, a really really great band i'm super psyched for you to be getting into them they're they're they have a bunch of records i think you'll really really like yeah uh chelsea wolf was another person oh. that was kind of invoked uh on yeah, some places absolutely. too um especially shit like apocalypse like all of her weirder shit or pain is beauty that oh god knowing that uh, knowing dead can dance and thinking about pain is beauty like all of the directions she took her sound on that album makes so much more sense now because that's like it's just so heavily derivative of that and the last thing that I'll mention here is I've listened to quite a bit, including a couple of new albums, but um, the one that I'll shout out is something that, again, our friend Pokey Gem put me on to, uh, and that is the album uh, Plague God by the band Absent in Body. And this is a very, very notable release because this is a super group by the lead singer, of the post-metal, black metal, doom metal band Amen Ra, which uh, if listeners remember, I talked about their album last year on our most underrated albums video. Uh, their album last year was a terrific release, um, but he's not the only person on there. There is also the drummer of the metal band Sepultra is on this album, as well as the guitarist from fucking Neurosis. All yeah, three Scott of these Kelly's in this band. Uh-huh. And they come together to make some of the most grimy, disgusting, titanic sludge metal I have heard in a long fucking time. This shit is like this mix is so fucking dense and layered with these absolutely cavernous drums and guitar pathways of distortion and the harrowing screaming of the Amon Ra vocalist and boy howdy does it make for a good listen it's a tight record it's only got a couple of songs on there and it's like 36 minutes it's a really concentrated project but this is a really I mean like an obviously impressive very um extreme exercise in what all of these artists uh, do really well except funnily enough the drummer from Sepultra who I mean his the 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 albums that he was on he's notable for being like this absolute fucking just like 
beast mode drummer. And on here, he's really focused on power as opposed to speed. He wears it like a glove. I mean, as everyone on here does, but it's just interesting to see him kind of flex that versatility. It's if you're interested in any of those bands or any of those genres, quintessential listening for the year for you. Fuck yeah. I still need to get into Sepultura. Like they're just one of those big canonical metal bands that I just haven't got Tons of to. Chaos AD. That's their yeah, most accessible from what I've heard so far. It's, and it's a it's banger. Quite August turned me on to them. Yeah, I really want to like knock down all of those sort of classic records that they have. They seem like a really interesting yeah, band. Bad. I'll start off with a re-listen of Thursday's Full Collapse, uh, an album I Ew. like a lot that I had not heard for a while. So I thought like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't as good anymore. And then I turned, it turned out I was wrong and it's still very good. Sick. And I love still, yeah, I love it when that happens and you're just like, it, it's good to be wrong sometimes and actually oh, yeah. like enjoy something that's just really kinetic, really immediately emotional. I find that record really good as a whole. I think it's only notable problems are that I think the highs are like really high and the albums lows are just kind of like, eh, do I really have to listen to this track? It, it, it's hard to beat understanding in a car crash, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and to be fair, most, most of the album is highs. Otherwise I wouldn't yeah. give it a positive score. Yeah, I mean, Understanding Car Crash is like one of the staple songs of of like post-hardcore in the 2000s, and it's not yeah. even top three on this album for me. I, 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 I'm definitely a bit more biased here because I, like Morgan, think this is a 10 out of 10 record, but it's also, the thing about Thursday as well is that it can be, you have to be in a particular mood, I think, to listen to an album like this because it's so like... yeah raucous and loud and abrasive and it's within its nation within its style that i i can't just throw this is unlike other 10 out of 10 records i have i can't really just throw this on any old time i have to be in a particular mood for it but that's it you know that's it i think paris and flames and standing on the edge of some a uh, paris and flames especially yeah. which is my favorite thursday song that's my favorite on there yeah. are just absolutely iconic incredible breaking you know, performances I think the band's melodic qualities are also also particularly shine when they juxtapose that with the super yeah. heavy stuff. I think that's where the group's power really lies. Like the screamed vocals on Understanding in the Car Crash are iconic. Good record. Speaking, mm -hmm. though, of a juxtaposition between screamed and sung melodic vocals, I listened to a I guess a bit of a classic in the world of gent music because I I'm I, evidently I've I've gone off the deep end uh, and listened to the self-titled Periphery album. Oh, Periphery. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. Album. Periphery is of course the kind of musical project of one Misha Mansour who is just a brilliant guitarist. I I was also listening to some of the Misha Mansour demos because those are like vocal without vocals, just him playing guitar. And those are also quite good. Notable for mm -hmm. also producing the self-titled Animals as Leaders album. And I mean, this record, I, I will say as a kind of thing for this band, it... <laughs> The vocals of Spencer Stiletto can be tough. I knew that was coming. They can be tough to get into. I personally enjoy them. And it took mm. me it, it took me a while to really vibe and gel with them. But I think I got into it really successfully. I think the album's really great from front to back. Lots of fun songs. Lyrics are a little kind of dorky which is a gent staple at this point this is why i like animals as leaders so much because they just do away with that entirely yeah Let, oh here's like the best the best review for this from 2011 when did justin bieber join after the burial <laughs> is a review on <laughs> okay, I, ha I have to hear this now i have to hear it's, what what that means 
it is not as ridiculous as that it sounds and it's and this is also a review from 2011 so it's kind of yeah early internet brain yeah just and i just bieber bad it's yeah i mean he is but no one cares anymore the, so. the, no, exactly. the queen singing is certainly like it's almost at odds with at least from what i remember about this album when i was really trying to get into like lots of prog metal staples is that like the <laughs> production and overall sound on, of this album is so like big and heavy and kind of it's dirty yeah and and like the vocals are so clean that it almost feels like it shouldn't like mesh together at first. But I actually do kind of agree is that this is an album that on first listen doesn't really hit you right. And then once you get accustomed to the rhythm of this band, like I, I really like their um, third and fourth album, actually. They've got their mm. fourth album is humorously called Hail Stan. Yes, um, Hail I'm Stan. I like that one too. <laughs> but you just kind of have to settle into the groove of what they're doing here because it is really enjoyable really instrumentally virtuosic shit which yeah is weird just because a lot of people don't really care for the first periphery album no but like and that's so weird to me that this is like significantly lower rated than anything else they've done it, it it's it's the same level of quality for me which is Pretty good. I mm, weird people are weird. I don't know, man. Yeah, people give Mashuga albums like every single one of them like a nine, and then they'll just be like, "This periphery album's bad." And I'm like, "It's my my brother in Christ. It's the same." It's um, <laughs> definitely a band that seems to be more Sputnik music than Rate Your Music, from what I can mm. gather. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. I just want oh to point God. out two I, things I, I, that I immediately I, know what that means and cannot articulate it in the slightest. I, I just want to quickly shout out a couple of things I've noticed here that made me laugh. The first is that their second album is called Periphery 2. This time it's personal. This time it's personal. Which obviously, you have to have a pretty good sense of humor about your band to do that. So I appreciate that. They, uh, and, they definitely have a sense of humor about titling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah which absolutely. is really like, nice. all of their album titles are just ridiculous um and the other thing i want to shout out is that uh the the bassist in this band for their second through to their fifth records on radio music is called adam get good get good <laughs> adam get good which is just like the funniest name ever it, I, I i almost refuse to believe that's real <laughs> i i'm pretty sure it's like if i doubt it is I would bet it's like a stage oh, rock metal so, dark souls get he good. Also, he also, he, he is, he's some interesting, I, I love checking out like the credits page on, on a lot of these random artists because you find out these re weird connections that are so funny. So apparently Adam get good uh, engineered the uh, Devon Townsend album transcendence um which is interesting oh he, and, yeah, and he also sense. engineered he also assisted with engineering mixing and vocals on empath uh oh which is crazy uh he engineered uh haken's vector album he he oh, okay are you two um, the best one yet well yes it, he, he is the person oh. who remixed uh cynics traced in ear there you go 2019 remix oh, uh, which is the that, superior sound version too. of that album yeah, yeah. so that was the one uh -huh. i was aware of so, so yeah i mean he he, he it, it looks as though his name is is an instruction to others not uh, a comment on his own skills <laughs> oh yeah he also um, um oh no that's not an album that's a single anyway i just noticed that he he mixed uh, a song called dissect yourself from a gent mathcore band called car bomb and just those, oh yes that car bomb are fucking awesome that that combination that band sounds cool as fuck mathcore and gent yeah fuck yeah i, 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 yeah. I, I just okay. love i, I just no, love that car bomb are fucking awesome and they put in like really like what's fun about car bomb and this is going to be a brief tangent but they put in like occasionally really twinkly electronics against just really fucking heavy instrumentals and vocals. I mean, this like this, there's a song. Uh, give me an album of theirs to listen like, to because I need this uh, shit. Morgil. It's their most recent one. You got it. Yeah, and, this theme seems really up my alley as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, what's that one single? I can't remember what it's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dissect yourself. Duh. That 
that yeah. has a really really funny kind of awesome little twinkly bit of it goes pew, 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 pew. i have a rate your music mutual who's usually pretty stingy on ratings who has this album at a full five stars which is pretty sick so i will be i will be checking this out very soon yeah yes i love car I bomber, love, car I love bomber sick. the best thing of the week so far uh has been from uh, indie pop post-punk revival group the long blondes and their record, oh yeah i saw that you rated this and i added it i want to listen to this uh someone to drive you home this is a really just really emotionally evocative well done kind of nerdy fun uh record in the genres i described they're from the uk they've got that they've got just really good production the right amount of heaviness and uh it's an album with a song that made me cry because it was like ow you <laughs> you you've come to me at the exact right point in my life and now this this is going to hurt forever damn uh, my favorite kind and I was shocked to learn this band only had two albums under their name because I'm like, these guys are really fucking good. How have I never heard of them? And as it turns out, their guitarist had a stroke at like 35. Oh no. And yeah. they pretty much, and that kind of put a stop to the band there. So I guess I, the last two things, not things I necessarily loved, but I still thought were worth shouting out. One of these is the EP Lava Land from math rock Midwest emo band Piglet. This is their sole release, and it's something that I I had seen like Brett was talking about, and so I checked it out on that basis. And I'd say the best, it's very like twinkly, kind of pristine, sparkly math rock. So if you're into like JoJo's record from this year, I'd say this is definitely worth your time because it's basically that same vibe about the same runtime of like 26 minutes, but it's only five like really structured, intricate songs. It, you know, I personally prefer my math rock a little on the heavier side of things. So that's why I'm still recommending it because I think there's a lot of good here to be found from people who like a bit of the lighter twinklier side of math rock and midwest emo oh yeah that, that sounds very much like my thing yeah so i would mainly check it out Riley. and the last thing i will be mentioning is pearl jams versus which i oh, hey. listen to i listened to a couple songs from that too the yeah the second pearl jam album i have been a big fan of 10 for a while I have an episode on 10 you should watch it if you have a great episode on 10 that yeah, was an episode yeah. that was just really fun to record that uh i will i'm not a big fan of verses honestly i think <laughs> it's good look i think it's a good album still i just think eddie vetter's singing on this record gets to a point where it feels a bit like self-parody from time to time there are some really good songs on here like rear view mirror oh, i'm glad you said rear oh, view mirror because to me that's, that's the song on this album along with yeah. um along with elderly woman behind the counter yes elderly woman behind oh, the counter in a small town is God. very good but oh, there's terrific song. there's other stuff like glorified g dissident <laughs> wma where i'm like this is not working for me no fair enough there's a few i think it's a bit of an inconsistent album um it, that's what i would say is mostly what it detracts from it is that so great songs are up there with the best stuff on 10 worst stuff is worse than the worst stuff on 10 well the funny thing about verses is it's always kind of fallen in between the cracks for me it's sort of never been one of my more loved pearl jam records despite having a lot of great songs on it despite being very easy for me to listen to and and it's funny because like my critique of this record is mainly that it's inconsistent and yet vitalogy is way more inconsistent and yet way more appealing 
um, because it's just so it, weird. It's because it goes for broke on all of its risks, you know? Like, Phytology is an album that is a mess, but it commits to being a mess. Yeah, whereas I think I agree. There are songs on verses like Glorified G and Blood and Rats uh, and yeah, Dissident rats. to a certain extent yeah. that are just like... And this is, I think, a problem that's true of a lot of Pearl Jam records, but this is one of the weird albums where it feels like they haven't quite like found that spark of just like, let's do whatever the fuck we want that they find on Vitality yeah. and that I think colors the rest of their work. So it is a bit yeah. of a transitional record for me. It's just a transitional record that happens to have, well, uh, another great, uh, two other great songs I really love, Go and Daughter, which are like, Daughter is one of the biggest Pearl Jam songs. Yeah. Daughter. Yes. No, I, I and, mean, um, yes. I'm and not got, denying the highs. I should yeah, say. it's just I weird. Morgan was here because I kind of fall into Riley's camp here, and I know Morgan like loves this album, uh, and and I wish I did too to some extent, but like I am more of a like not an agnostic, but it's like I just kind of it, it again. It falls between two albums that I just enjoy a whole lot more. So yeah, I, I will say no, I'm that, interested to check out Vitalogy. I will say that I have a really, a really like soft spot for uh, Windows Media Audio. Uh, <laughs> just no, that, okay. I guess I guess no one else. No, I get the Joe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. It's I, just I just not funny. Want it's to fine. beat you to death. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> a bad I'll file format. I'll, anyway. I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, you better you like talking because it's your turn to talk about what you've been listening to, Riley. Right. Okay. Um, Bam. Transition. I listened to a house record that our good friend and guest on the podcast, April, recommended when she was on the podcast back in January. This is DJ Sprinkles Midtown 120 Blues. It's a like an it's a strange record. It's like an ambient house record that has like a very. It's also kind of like a a leftist political uh diatribe as well it's a really interesting mixture of like trying to reconnect i guess the roots of house music and kind of confront the gentrification of of that sort of genre of music and the history of that sort of music but also at the same time just making a really chill and vibey ambient house record it's a curious um it's a curious and very unique thing uh, i i think that your mileage will be limited on it if you're not super into the sort of vibey house music aesthetic, but it is a very easy record to put on. And yet at the same time, it's very subversive and it's approach to messaging and the sort of style of history lesson by way of expo exposing you to the roots of the sound. Um, it's really interesting for that reason. Uh, I listened to my second album from one of my, an artist who's becoming one of my favorite ambient artists that being Hiroshi Yoshimura I listened to his album Wetland uh this week I've actually listened to it quite a few times I just had it on a loop uh it's not on nowhere near the level of uh, music for nine postcards to me but it is a very plaintive and beautiful uh ambient record it has a kind of new agey aesthetic to it it's very like of its era um because this was, one was made in the 90s and it has some of those sort of not cheesy but there's sort of some aesthetics to it that i think are a little ill-fitting but overall the vibe is, is reasonably immaculate and there's some beautiful beautiful moments on there and it's a it's a good little ambient record that i did enjoy a, a fair amount um and the only other thing i think i, I will shout out is that uh, a band the mysterious neo soul collective salt um, oh, yeah. appear, appear to be based in the uk but there's very little that people actually know about this collective um, they just occasionally, not even occasionally, but quite frequently, will just out of the blue drop a record. Uh, and this week they released their sixth album in the last three years. Uh, it's a record called Ear, and it is the first Salt record I've heard, but I understand that they're a neo-soul group, which made this record particularly surprising because this is not a neo-soul record at all. This is a modern classical, minimalist classical record. It very much oh. feels evocative of Philip Glass. Uh, I think if you enjoy Philip Glass works, like Glass, that was not even intentional. If you enjoy Glass works and you enjoy Einstein mm -hmm. on the beach or just about anything that uh, Philip Glass has put out, you'll very much enjoy Ear, the new Salt record, because it's very much in that vein. Uh, it, it's quite beautiful. It's quite gorgeous. It has these... Uh, this sense of, of kind of 
continuous flow to it that feels very evocative of glass and artists like uh, other minimalists as well, like Steve Reich too. Uh, there's, I think, enough shades of the cultural background of salt and the preoccupations and interests that are more akin to where the members of this collective are from than the kind of more westernized uh americanized style of, of philip glass so it, it offers something i think original in the way that it twists this aesthetic but it's a really interesting record it's really kind of just like one continuous piece of music for 45 minutes split it up into tracks and i really enjoyed it so uh, I, I can recommend that i'll be digging back into their previous work to hear where they've kind of come from but seeing as this seems to be a bit of a departure for them i commend them and i am very intrigued to see what else their music what the rest of their music is like so uh yeah that gets a shout out from me and i think that's all i really need to shout out this week so let's move into our first review of the day which is of course the new album from father john misty chloe Chloe in the next 21st century. So, Father John Misty, where to begin? Father! <laughs> what, how to tell the story of Father John Misty? Well, I don't Father! think we really need to. Um, <laughs> he's been around for a while now, a solo artist. He's been doing his own thing. Very much uh, one of these kind of like postmodern, sort of ironic artists who has adopted this kind of chamber pop loungy aesthetic to kind of create these subversive and slightly satirical songs about celebrity and politics and he's had this interesting career where the these preoccupations and these interests of his and his sense of humor about them has kind of drawn him a lot of attention from press and kind of made him into this very sort of personalized figure that people you know see as this icon and character in like indie chamber baroque pop music or whatever you want to call it and so this is a really interesting album because this progression for him of like this very meta reflexive sort of self-commentary music on on the persona and personality of father john misty aka josh tillman kind of peaked or climaxed with his last record god's favorite customer which was kind of like falling into the rabbit hole of his own neuroses and kind of chronicling a breakdown that he had and turning that into an album that kind of reflects on where all of this has brought him and so i think it makes sense that he took a break after that a much needed break it sounds like and has completely kind of refocused his artistic approach I think uh, there's still recognizably a lot of shades of Father John Misty in this new record. I think obviously the vocals are him. He has got an unmistakable voice, but he has taken some of those more chamber pop uh, aspects of some of that earlier music, and he has infused that with these very lush and very kind of anachronistic, like early 20th century uh, arrangements that evoke sort of lounge jazz and sort of 1920s jazz music and it's a very interesting aesthetic for him and more pertinently to this career progression thing this is like the first father john misty album that has not been in any way about father john misty this has been this is an incredibly depersonalized record for him he has i think sought to remove the Father John Misty persona from being the subject of these songs. And he's essentially approaching this as a kind of songwriter who is telling these stories about these fictional characters that provides a little bit of sort of subtle commentary on celebrity and on the nature of um, you know, living in the 21st century, which is where that anachronistic thing comes in because it's so referential to uh, 20th century music. But really that stuff is fairly subtle and it's very much this shift in an approach to songwriting for Father John Misty. And I'm curious, I know you both are, are fans of his previous work, what this, how this direction has kind of struck you and, and what your impressions have been of, of, of this new sort of development for Mr. Misty. 
I guess I'll start off right away by right off the bat by saying I'm not much of a fan of this new development. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I I know Burr August hates everything. But <laughs> sh- shut the fuck up, hear me out. Uh, yeah, I, I for my first listen, I I remember messaging you guys like this is an interesting record because it definitely is and it took a couple listens for me to really grapple with my feelings about primarily the instrumentals because storytelling wise I think this is still Father John Misty that even if there's that shift in in uh, tense that shift in perspective there are still some songs that have very pertinent, hard-hitting, kind of first-person narrated uh, stories. I'm thinking of stuff like Goodbye, Mr. Blue, which is, in my opinion, one of the gigantic highlights on this album. And that's stuff I really like. I really think where this album suffers are in two ways. In some of the more esoterically written parts, also admittedly not a big fan of the whole instrumental aesthetic of the record that's just my opening thoughts i'll turn the floor over to uh, jake uh well as i've stated before semi recently at least is that i've been following father john misty's music for a while now the pure comedy was a really big record for me when it first came out and i just you know differing levels of enjoyment but I have really found something to love and basically almost all of his projects thus far and uh I have been listening to this for a lot longer than it's been out um because it leaked a long time ago um which is good because frankly I don't want to talk about an album like this with like a limited frame of reference just because I feel like it's I mean, and then this is just the way I respond to his music is that it's like after a week, me, Jake Anderson, is not going to be able to form a particularly cogent opinion on the record. Um, Primarily because I'm still unpacking my thoughts on stuff he's made in the past, but I am a really big fan of God's Favorite Customer. Um, Very specifically. I mean, Honey Bear too. I own that on fucking vinyl. Um, And I'll say that I can basically like i'm i won't lie i saw what august had this rated as but like as soon as i saw what you had given the album i was just like you know it's it's because this album sounds like like a like a billy joel album that's that's what it is here i i get it um which is not entirely true there's a little bit more like classical like lounge jazz sounds here that are a bit more ornate Um, But again, if you're a big fan of something like The Stranger, you're probably not going to find yourself too far away from home here. Um, And yeah, that's the thing is that this, like, the depersonalization is certainly something that I feel like you can respond to in any number of ways. But I just kind of think that it particularly for this album, after taking a break and coming back to music, that was probably, no matter what your thoughts are, the best decision he could have made is because frankly... Josh Tillman's ego is both his greatest asset and his biggest weakness in that it can propel some of the heights of his songwriting and instrumental ambition to some of the best tracks on something like Pure Comedy and also some of the lesser tracks on something like Pure Comedy uh, just because he tends to be, you know, this really self-involved person that can occasionally just sort of wander into writing and kind of philosophy in a way that feels a bit I won't say juvenile but just a bit like basic frankly it's a bit like you know 16 year old has just discovered r slash philosophy and has been reading it for a little bit too long it's just like did you all know that the world is actually bad and it's like sure that's certainly a problem it's that and it's also like the combination of that with like the constant need to like um, showcase the fact that he's self-aware about how this all sounds as well. And it works yeah. and it, it works and it doesn't in certain ways. I'm, I'm, I'm a very torn on a record, like p- pure comedy. I think um, it's probably his weakest record to date for me, but it has some really great uh, moments on it. Some, and I really admire it in a lot of ways, but 
that record and i think it's so inextricably tied to god's favorite customer at least god's favorite customer is so inextricably tied to that record because like there it's it's this it's the swollen nature of father john misty's ego and then it's the collapse into depression and like like i said with a record like god's favorite customer it feels very much like the full stop on this kind of arc that you see him go on ever since his first solo record so it makes sense and it's wise as you say to shift gears completely here i think and even still even though he drenches himself in a kind of detached irony is that even on stuff like pure comedy he is still able to convey a sense of genuine emotional sincerity whenever he wants to which is basically why like on paper I should fucking hate this man. I should not like a single song of his. And the fact that I do is kind of a testament to the quality here. Um, that said, I do think this is a really interesting album, all things considered, um, mainly through the point of view is that like, this is kind of like, this is like Father John Misty's Nebraska and that he's kind of like, there are some songs where he is directly involved with someone else in it, but it's not particularly like about him. Goodbye, Mr. Blue is a song that uh, August mentioned. I agree, that's probably a, a highlight for me as well, um, which it's probably just a combination of this, album's aesthetic and just what the song is about the whole like house cat thing i imagine the song to be about fucking um who the fucking Ra uh altman movie uh the, the detective guy. guy yeah um it makes <laughs> me think that main character in the long goodbye is like what this song is um, well, the, the difference is, is that, that, that in the long goodbye, uh, he loves his cat, and in this song, yes. it's kind of like the the comedy comes from a, it, how like completely apathetic he is towards the cat. A bitter reminder of like this cat that represents a, a broken relationship, yeah. essentially, and he's like begrudgingly going to buy it as expensive food before it dies, like which is just it's really quintessentially Josh Tillman's uh, writing style, which I find to be it, it walks a tight tightrope but it often does it well um but i will say for as much as i love the instrumental aesthetic of this album and the thing that i i think that this is maybe his best sounding album just i mean probably has to do with the fact that i do like this aesthetic but genuinely i do think this is some of the most textural production he's worked with i'm kind of glad he moved away from like the the psychedelic inclinations that he had just because I feel like he kind of tapped out on that. Like he didn't ever do it badly, but I just kind of wanted him to do something else. And this kind of darker, sultrier, but still kind of lively um, sound here is, is really well implemented. That said, all of the issues I have with this album do kind of have to do with how the sound kind of intermingles with whatever John finds himself doing. For example, um, I think the opening run of three tracks, Chloe, Goodbye, Mr. Blue, and Kiss Me, I Loved You. I love those songs. I think they're pretty great. Um, everything but her love. I'm not really sure what the point is of making his voice sound so buried in this mix all of a sudden. And yeah, just was, the uh, vocals. Interesting. I, I don't understand why the, the, the lack of presence here doesn't do anything. It doesn't really help that the song itself is kind of the, one of the more anodynely written tracks on here that I don't get as much out of and you know and yeah. then again though okay. it's like the, the second i'm disappointed in the album even slightly though you go back into something like buddy's rendezvous which is again one of the most sincere hard on sleeve songs that ha just happens to be immaculate sounding mm -hmm. and then there are songs that i just really you know just kind of they're cheeky and they cause me to laugh like q4 about a uh, a kind of sellout author um that, that's the you know, biggest was, grower on the album for me that song i wasn't I, really a fan of it when it came out as a single but now in the context of the record and just really like getting the songwriting it's super funny yes. and um and yeah. i think it's, it's kind I of emblematic of a lot of what this record does um but yeah buddy's it, rendezvous it, it, is hands down the best song on this album i think amazing amazing I, track i think i would agree with that it, statement it's, and I, it's like I, the yeah the album has yeah. kind of three sections for me and the middle one is definitely the weakest. Buddy's Rendezvous is a standout there, but everything that surrounds it on the middle of this is distinctly just a just a teensy bit weaker for me. It, it's all incremental, and it's nothing that, like, there are occasions where he's sort of the pastiche sound that he's leaning into, like on the aforementioned uh, Everything But Her Love. It, it holds it back more than I would like to admit that it does, but he comes back swinging in that final third, 
with uh, Funny Girl, Only a Fool, We Could Be Strangers in the Next 20th Century, which I love all of these songs. I think they're great. Th- this is just a really good, consistent album from him, but I will admit its appeal is more limited than it's ever been really which i think is why the general consensus on this album is like yeah it's good and it's like it's just something and i understand i like i'm not really over the moon about it but it's an interesting development it's a fresh turn for josh and it's a turn that i appreciate just as someone who's always had just a little bit of trouble processing his whole deal this is a more unassuming direction that doesn't sacrifice anything of what makes him great it's certainly an aesthetic change that not everybody's going to like but if you're in this for josh tillman's songwriting and for his humor or whatnot i don't think you'll leave that disappointed unless something about the album heavily weighs it down for you like it does with august so the thing about this record is that you do have these instrumentals which I think are divinely produced and immaculate and, and, and super well orchestrated, even if they don't, if they might not necessarily have the urgency and energy that some people might want from a Father John Misty record. I still think mm-hmm. that tracks like Q4 and tracks like We Could Be Strangers as well, like really strong highlights for me. And a lot of it comes down to, so these lovely lush ornate instrumentals are great, but they the songs really hinge on the song writing like from a fundamental yes. level, like if the songwriting's not up to snuff, then the aesthetic itself and, and the loungy kind of, you know, dreaminess of it can kind of feel, can kind of fall off. It can kind of become tiresome if the songwriting's not up there. This is why I think that songs like Q4 and We Could Be Strangers are absolute highlights of the record because from a songwriting perspective, these are anybody's rendezvous because from a songwriting perspective, these are incredibly emotional, but funny, uh, wry, self-aware songs. Like We Could Be Strangers is is an absolute highlight for me for the way that it kind of like presents this bickering, arguing couple and then kind of like pulls the rug from under you as you realize that it kind of like dying in a car crash. Uh, (laughs) And whereas other moments on this record i think like kiss me and olvidado and only a fool to some extent are at least successful for me personally because some of that a lot of that wit and a lot of that kind of depth that you get from the songwriting on some of those other highlights isn't really here as much and the instrumentals while nice and i want to shout out olvidado which is has a lovely kind of yeah. bossa nova uh, uh, instrumental which is an original touch on the record but it feels insubstantial when not partnered with Tillman at his sharpest. And I think that there are moments on this record where he falls a little short there. Uh, the, the reference point I want to bring up, the thing that I thought of, the album I thought of the most while listening to this, in terms of a career trajectory and also in terms of sound, and it's not quite a good fit in terms of career trajectory because this album is not as dramatic a shift from Misty's previous works as the album I'm about to reference. But I thought a lot of Arctic Monkeys, Tranquility Base, Hotel and Casino. While yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think that's a record that is incredibly admirable for the, you know, for the sharpness of the shift that it represents and also for how like incredibly well thought out. What do you mean you never seen Blade Runner? (laughs) Incredibly how well thought out its whole concept (laughs) is, Uh, but also an album that despite all of that really falls short in the musical department for a lot of it. And this is, this can kind of be, I think this is a much more successful album than this one, but can kind of have the opposite problem where uh, from an instrumental perspective, it's almost always really there, but from a songwriting perspective, it can and can occasionally um, fall short a little bit. So I'm a little bit mixed here, but overall, I would say that this is a solid record from Tillman. I think it's probably solidly rank it in, in the middle of his discography so far. I think I'd put it behind um, Honey Bear, which is still my favorite of his, and and God's favorite customer, but I would put it ahead of uh, pure comedy and fear of fun so it's yeah it's it's a it's a solid release and i'm interested to see uh, it feels to me like he's heralding a a, a, sh- a, a wider shift that we're going to see represented in his subsequent records but who knows uh, he could be back to being his like incredibly on the nose satirical self maybe this is it's a slate cleaning record or maybe he is going to go further down this uh loungy torch song singer drunken barroom vibe 
uh, one of the comparisons I came up with uh, on Twitter yesterday while listening to this was that it's kind of like the kind of oh, music yeah. you would hear in in the the ballroom of the Overlook Hotel when you're when you're the caretaker and, and you're slowly sort of going insane. Some of the horns on shit like Olvidado are like, I swear to God, they could have been ripped out of The Shining. Swear to God, it's the same. Yeah, I, I thought of this particularly on uh, the songs Chloe and uh, We Could Be Strangers, uh, which to me, mm-hmm. both of those songs have this real, really strong sense of that kind of instrumental presence. Actually, the, the instrumental on We Could Be Strangers, especially when it comes in, actually makes me think of Angelo Badalamenti, uh, strangely enough. It's yeah. kind of Twin Peaksy vibe, like not the kind of uh, dreamy Twin Peaks theme vibes, but kind of like when you're hanging out in the diner of Twin Peaks, the kind of music that you would hear in those sorts of Pink scenes. Pink room shit. Yeah, exactly. Badass music. So that's kind of stuff I thought of. But um, but yeah, I broadly overall was pretty positive on this. You know, that's funny that my biggest source of reference is I was listening to this and really enjoying it. And then I was like, you know, for as much as I like this, it's really a damn shame that that um, Destroyer album came out because while not totally similar sonically, I find the ethos of the records very similar. And that album just kind of works a little bit better and a little bit more consistently when it comes to the embodiment of the character and yeah. the poetic oh. lyricism and the instrumentals like it, it's just it's just close enough to I'm, be I'm, like that i'm glad you mentioned that actually because now you say that it's very clear to me that josh tillman is trying to be dan behar to a certain extent yeah and um i think there are other destroyer records that sound even more similar to this one but i probably oh, I still bet. do like more so yeah that's another i guess reason why maybe i'm not completely in love with this although i love the overall kind of lushness and sound of it is that it, it does there are i think other artists who have executed similar things better but i still commend uh josh for his commitment to the bit here it, 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 these are mm. for the most part very well realized songs and very kind of thoughtfully composed ones too i guess i'll i'll conclude my own feelings uh now that i've kind of primed them uh in that i don't <laughs> I can't say I I agree really at all about the instrumentals. I think they sound just mostly tacky and the production, yes, is fine and is well done at places. I just think it doesn't come together as him really venturing too far outside anything you could just get out of the 1950s or 60s. It sounds, yeah, very pastiche without adding much else to it. And moments that were aforementioned, like uh, Oliviado and like Everything But Her Love, where the songwriting is not up to snuff, moments like that, yeah, just fall so flat because I have nothing to grasp onto. And I think of a, a particular quote from Morgan in the context of this album where he said something to the effect of you can have a great album with great music and mediocre lyrics but you can't have an album with mediocre music and great lyrics and that's a lot of what this embodies for me that something similar to that sentiment is just I the musical quality of this record is just not there for me and it's not it's doing basically nothing for me i I think that's a fair take to be honest i think that's a fair assessment from from your perspective i don't find that uh difficult to understand where you're coming from i think there are moments where he does lean a little bit too much on like i'm doing this now (laughs) and and that Mm. can kind of um i think come at the sacrifice of of, of a more holistic record songwriting wise but anyway yeah it it sounds kind of silly but i will say i want to lend some credence to august's point here and that i actually agree i actually the instrumentals are tacky that's kind of why i like them like it just feels kind of part and parcel of what the album's doing, which I'm not trying to like argue against it, but it's like, that's kind of why I'm okay with them being so overbearingly pastiche and cheesy. It's Mm. just within that realm of detached irony that to the point where he makes it mostly work, but I can't say it like, you know, it's got to work for everybody because I mean, it's fucking weird. 
All righty. Well, then, shall we do our favorite tracks and ratings for Father John Misty's mm. Chloe in the next 21st century? Jake, why don't you lead us off? All right. Uh, my three favorite tracks are going to be Chloe, uh, Buddy's Rendezvous, and probably Goodbye, Mr. Blue. And his favorite song is probably Everything But Her Love. I give the album a, 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 a nice light seven. I would say for me, it's Goodbye, Mr. Blue, Buddy's Rendezvous, and Chloe. So come to think of it, same three as Jake. And least favorite's going to be Oliviado Otromento. Uh, it gets a five from me. All righty. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Buddy's Rendezvous, uh, We Could Be Strangers, and I never mentioned this, but the, the next 20th century, the closing track here, I think is fantastic. Uh, so I will uh, shout that out as well. My least favorite is probably Kiss Me. Uh, and I will give the album, um, I'll give it a seven and a half just to, to emphasize my my liking a bit more so that gives us an average overall of 6.5 for father john misty's chloe in the next 20th century all right let's move into our second review of the day which is the new jack white album fear of the dawn jack white so one thing that's interesting and um i'm stealing this bit a little bit from indycast who did their last week's episode on these two albums as well where it's like you have these sort of i guess faded glory is probably a little bit too dramatic of a term to describe misty but you have these artists who i think are generally regarded as as existing within a particular time frame and now they're kind of like solo artists who are slightly outside of the zeitgeist and i guess kind of reckoning with that in different ways in terms of like male singer songwriter artists well i guess jack white's well, not really a singer songwriter but whatever uh they, they made that point much more elegantly than i could have but uh jack white has sort of been i don't want to say adrift but he certainly has sort of been in this weird wilderness ever since the white stripes ended where he has tried i think to carve out a niche as an interesting solo rock artist in and of his own right and has i think frequently and repeatedly come up against the limits of his ability in that regard and i don't want to poo poo jack white because i i do think he's talented and i know that generally speaking this podcast is not really a huge fat fan of the white stripes which i understand i'm pretty middle middling and mixed on them as well even if i had a, have a, a strong uh childhood attachment to albums like elephant i like them a lot oh okay that, that's that's somewhat reassuring then but i, I think I, it's i have heard seven nation army at every sports game i've ever gone to yeah. as has jake i would assume yeah, I mean, it's it's an so, inescapable song. Um, Rhiannon had to play this song about a thousand times because she was in marching band. So, I mean, oh, wow. Nice I, don't, I, I don't envy that. So I think it's fair to say that ever since the white stripe, the white, the white stripes ended. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> white for this album. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm just like, you just like, oh, Riley just stole a perfectly good bit I could have used um, accidentally. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, it's fair to say Jack has kind of been in the hinterlands ever since the White Stripes ended. I, he started, he tried to start a solo career in the early 2010s with uh, records like Blunderbuss. I don't even, there's an obvious joke there I'm not even going to go for, which is just a kind of very mediocre record, I think. Uh, more kind of blues pastiche. Like, thing about Jack White, this is true of all of his music, is it comes through a lot how hopelessly he enamored he is with the blues and i mean like 50s 60s blues artists he's sung the praises of the classic blues artists so much and he's been so influenced by blues playing and his guitar work and all that sort of stuff and now his hair is blue so i think that's maybe on a subconscious extension of that to some extent um, of course he has blue hair and pronouns there we go you've got to get that out of your system uh, so that's, I think, something that stayed true. And then in 2014, I think he put out Lazaretto, which I think was a, a better record than Blunderbuss. Still a frustratingly yeah. middling one. The title track I thought was really good on that album. Uh, some really interesting guitar playing, but it still felt very much like Jack White kind of just 
do, making a Jack White record and not really doing anything distinct or interesting. However, that did change with 2018's Boarding House Reach, which was a marked a really significant shift for Jack White because while he's always kind of been thought of as this incredibly kind of like a strict purist for like analog sound, the richness of real rock and roll, man. He's had this weird shift recently where he's kind of like veered away from that. And he's made these really strange and bizarro records that are very much not real rock and roll. And, and, and particularly in the case of this new record are like, this new record is like, I think completely digitally recorded. So there's like, and a lot of digital effects on it and it's very, very synthetic. So it's almost like Jack is, kind of trying to deliberately punch a hole in the kind of image that he has as this kind of like stuck in the past you know old rock fogey and what's interesting about that image is that I've always found it to be strangely unfounded because he's like so clearly like a a late Gen X or early millennial type of rock artist anyway and he, he embodied that I think while kind of bringing back some of the, the, the classical rock and roll roots and the White Stripes. But anyway, Boarding House Reach, fucking bananas album. I do not like that record. I think it's a fucking, not fun to listen to. It's a pain. I I've regrettably always... do like Boarding House Reach <laughs> as loathed as I am to admit it, frankly, which makes this so much more difficult to <laughs> talk a, about. There's a couple of interesting moments, but overall I felt like, that, that record seemed to me like Jack just purposefully trying to go as fucking wild as possible to just throw people off. And I assumed going into his next record that we'd get kind of return, a return to business as usual from Mr. White. And um, that's not true. This record is still bizarro. This record is still weird. And it's really funny. And I think, Jake, 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 I know you hate this, but I think just from the outside, it's really funny that you like Boarding House Reach. I hate Boarding House Reach. You hate this album. And I, I know you hate this album quite strongly. And I have a begrudging affection for it because for me, I feel like this is, it's not a great record and it has some severe limitations, I think by design, but still they are things that give it a, pre a reasonably low ceiling. But that said, to me, this feels like a much more consistently and holistically better realized vision of the kind of gonzo, weirdo, like digitized guitar aesthetic that he was going for on Boarding House Reach. To me, the vision here is more unified. It helps that the album is considerably shorter too. And um, the thing that, that I was reminded a lot of artists like Ty Siegel and even the OCs and these kind of like psychedelic 2010s guitar bands who like took this psychedelic scuzzy sort of guitar sound and like really ratcheted it up to absurd levels. And Jack kind of does that here, but he also like digitizes it so that his guitar sounds like a buzzsaw in just about every song on this record. And it's, it, it's really more like his guitar is so heavily processed that the guitar sounds sound like brass instruments. Like yes. they sound like horns at the point where he distorts mm. them on this album. Yeah. And that I think is a, a neat way of encapsulating uh, why you can probably tell pretty quickly whether this album is going to be for you or not uh and i'm gonna <laughs> before you, i want to and i'm gonna let you guys go off about how shit this album is because i really i, I it's going to make for great content but before you do i i just want to make a, a a small bit of clarification because i feel the need to justify my enjoyment I mean, specifically of the guitar sound on this record, because like I can already see some of the reference points that you guys are going to bring up in terms of, well, we, we talked about this Royal Blood album and the guitar sounded like shit on this album. And, and so <laughs> how come you like that? And so I'll try my best here because, but I realize that it's going to be hard for me to do this without sounding like at least a little bit of a hypocrite. Yes. The guitar sound on this record is not conventionally, I mean, I mean, saying it's not conventionally good is kind of like underselling it because it's not even like conventional. The way you described it is great. Like it's, it's purposefully trying to make the guitar sound like this squalling, digitized, foreign miasma of this really kind of dissonant sound. And the reason I think it works is because Jack goes so far into the red with it. 
I think this is a record that I enjoy to a certain extent. Again, it has a, a ceiling, but I enjoy it to a certain extent because of how ridiculously off the wall these tonalities are. And also the fact that he, it helps that, in my opinion at least, he exercises these tonalities in the, in the, in the construct of riffs that are pretty fucking good riffs like to be honest the riffs go hard on this record and i don't think that can be disputed what can be disputed is the tastefulness and enjoyability of the tones and tonality with which they performed and i'll let you guys get into that but i found this to be a considerably more satisfying listening than boarding house reach because it felt more like jack had a clear holistic idea of what kind of record he wanted to make in this vein and it just kind of goes it has some moments that are somewhat questionable, but I think uh, when you kind of get on and on the level of this record, it's they kind of start to make a little bit more sense, even if they still aren't super palatable. Um, but I'm in the unevenable position of having to mount a lukewarm defense of an album I just kind of like, uh, and I have to make that case particularly strong to juxtapose against the cases of two people who I think fundamentally hate this album. So I'll let you guys go off now, and because um, I want to hear exactly what your experiences have been like listening to this thing, uh, and, I, and I'm very curious to hear your overall thoughts. I have been placed in a somewhat precarious position, much like Riley, who finds himself having to present the defense of this, even though he hates Boarding House Reach. And I have to explain why I hate this and like Boarding House Reach. And <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is that everything Riley said about Boarding House Reach, I completely agree with it. It's just that that's why that album works for me anyway, in that- the start a corporation the who's with me. I mean, look, I'm not saying it's subtle. I'm not even saying it's great. No, it's I am, however, saying sure. it is that every song on that album is a bonkers, batshit crazy idea, but it is a complete idea. I don't ever feel like I'm listening to drafts of songs when I'm listening to Boarding House Reach. Um, and again, that album totally has its problems. But the fact that it doesn't really obey any rules whatsoever is what makes it interesting to me is because that's what Jack White has been doing this whole time is playing it safe. And then afterwards, he leans into something more idiosyncratic, and I'm just much more willing to meet it halfway, especially when it's such a big departure from being so boring. And then you have this, and frankly, trying to pinpoint like the trajectory of Jack White, right? Now, it's, it's a fucking pointless endeavor because what he has decided to do with his career is he, he is so dedicated to those aforementioned idiosyncrasies that I almost feel as if he's just doing shit and waiting for some part of the mainstream to like it in like a desperate roulette board fucking dart blindfold tied around your eyes maybe i'll fucking hit it this time and, and i think just... you're i think you're projecting a little bit there jake to me he seems to be wanting to do the opposite like he seems to be like he seems to be like so dedicated to shedding his image that the image that's kind of been imposed on him of, of one of these kind of like classic rock you know defenders like the the modern era of like real rock music defenders man he feels to me like he's deeply uncomfortable with that label and he's like lashing out against it and making these records that are almost deliberately designed to offend the sensibilities of like the rick beato type fucking like this is how real rock sounds man and look results may vary but to me he seems so laser focused on doing that that he becomes automatically by virtue of that more interesting than i don't know people who are just purely pastiching like the good old days i mean sure i think my point was really more along the lines of it just it, it he's certainly trying to shed that perceived image but the problem is is that there's nothing beneath the shedding it's just like that that's it like there, there's nothing, there's no meat to the dish that is Jack White's solo career in that it is all about just getting rid of something else and replacing it with something that's not that. 
I and agree, incidentally. I think I would agree with that. There we go. And what this all means is that he's inevitably just going to make something that event basically offends the sensibilities of even people who are going to get along with him. Um, like me, I mean, again, I probably like the White Stripes more than anyone here, even though I'm not like a massive fan or anything, but you know, my, my, my ex-girlfriend was really into them. So that should, I mean, Same. the fact that I'm still willing to admit that they're good. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> um, that, is, that is all to say. Fear a, of the dawn. Look, look at these fucking this, losers over here. <laughs> this this album is genuinely. I I am impressed with one facet of it, and that Jack White has managed to create the first eighty minute long, forty minute album. Every like starting off with the first song, which is just by several miles my least favorite thing here oh, really? oh god where do i even fucking begin I where to stand begin out. With taking, me back? <laughs> taking me back immediately presents you with again the most distorted ugly guitar sound ever and i don't give a fuck whether or not it's an organic or an electronic guitar i really don't but Jack on this album seems to be like, what if on this song I sounded like the Black Keys and on this song I sounded like Death From Above and this guitar tone is like Roger Waters' Pink Floyd shit and this guitar tone is this and this guitar tone is that. Look at all these guitar tones. And I'm just like, yeah, man, they all sound like shit. They all sound, they, 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 they like to say it's like compressed or bricked out. It, it doesn't do it justice. It's so overbearingly distorted and fuzzy. And that, that black keys thing, that's what really kills me is that Jack White is making the kind of music that the black keys were making when they got accused of ripping Jack White off. This feels like that, but even more watered down. It's just that like on this album, Jack has a real knack for lending everything a specific instrumental presence, a, a rather muscular presence even. It's just that beyond that, these songs have nothing to them. Structurally, they're a weasel, they're a wazzle, they're completely fucking, they're, they, they don't exist. And he is just hell bent and determined. Like again, I could get on board with him on Boarding House Reach, even though he had some questionable vocal moments on there, don't get me wrong. But every fucking time he opens his mouth on this album, I want to fucking strangle him. He sounds like if Julian Casablancas was tone deaf. It is insipid. I hate listening to this man screeching like this. And he just talks like he's overly emotive about everything. Like, man, I'm sorry. You're not David Bowie. Please stop trying to sound like David Bowie. Please, I'm begging you, use your limited vocal range in a way that sounds like it doesn't want to actively kill me in audio form. And, you know, again, lyricism. I, 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 I it, it's I like, ho. It, you know, th that's the thing. That's, that's one of my preferred tracks on this album, just because it really? feels like, well, it's, I mean, first of all, it's hilarious. I mean, I, I can't help but like every single second this album is on, I want it to be over, except when Q-Tip is on it um, because it's fucking funny. It's not good, but it's fucking funny. Um, even like his bars and stuff is just like, God, did a fucking five-year-old write this shit? Fucking <laughs> AB rhyme scheme ass shit. And that's the thing is that he still adds more like depth to this. And like, I, I can see people Cock now just being block, like, well, sock in this jock. This, the spirit of rock music is that it's like rough and tumble and kind of like, you know, it's like the Rolling Stones and shit and like everything's just kind of roughly put together and that's what makes it real, man. And it's like, it's like Jack White is an artist that exists solely to abuse this tactic to get people to defend him so that he can just do the goofiest, silliest, most nonsensical and ugly shit and have people come out of the woodworks and be like, um, actually, it's in keeping with the spirit of true rock and roll. <laughs> and I shut the fuck up. Any, like, I, I can't, I, part of me feels a bit gaslit by the public at large because this is an album that's being received fairly well. And like, I'm not saying that you have to like Boarding House Reach. But like the disparity between the reception of these two albums, I'm like, why do you like what people who aren't Riley? Why? 
Like, really, I, I, he can explain it in a way I can understand. I am asking you all now. I want a dissertation on my desk on Friday by, uh, give me, give me a reason why Jack White needs to do a, a two-parter in the form of esophobia, which the second half of does not sound like the first part of the song. And lyrically speaking is just like, you could have called it something else and it just wouldn't have mattered. And like lyrically all across the board here, it's just Jack shouting about vague bullshit. And I can, again, I can see the people now and just being like, you fucking sound like some old fucking crony writing for fucking Rolling Stone or something like these people are destroying rock music. I don't think that I don't fucking care. What I care about is the fact that this is 40 straight minutes of this man thinking he can do the new abnormal, except like if every guitar sound sounded like a fart, every single one of them is just like, it sounds like the most detailed textured fart you've ever captured on audio like it's it's almost impressive just to be like oh wow that had a lot of like actual dynamic going on there yeah yeah yeah. but the 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 first half of this is a wasteland the second half isn't better mind you it just contains things that annoy me significantly less that's that's exactly how i feel actually jake and the album that came to mind was uh, blood sugar sex magic because <laughs> of the mental callus. We cannot that. get away from the red hot chili peppers, <laughs> no matter how hard we try. But see, that's the thing is that, that there's he gets closer to having a complete idea for a song on the second half on songs like uh, that was then, this is now, the morning, noon, and night, and the only song on here that I will deem anywhere near good, which is The Closer Shedding My Velvet, and which is, like, good by the merit of the fact that it just doesn't find a way to piss me off throughout the entirety of it. It's just, like, it just doesn't really ever slip into it, but, like, just immediately, everything is just so garish, and his vocal presence is obnoxious, and he's just He's singing about nothing. And I, I know you can be like, oh, well, actually, that's part of the message that he's trying to make with the rock. And I, I don't care what this man is saying. He could have gotten fucking, the, I don't know, the, the best vocalist real, alive right now. He could, have, he could have resurrected <laughs> Freddie fucking Mercury to sing these lyrics. And I would still say that they were dog shit and shouldn't be here. <laughs> Let me, it, let me, I, I want to I quote one of this my This album's favorite. not about anything other no, than being me. annoying. <laughs> I want to quote some of my favorite uh, bad lyrics on this album here. Uh, from there's, my there's favorite so song, many. From my favorite song, which is What's the Trick? Uh, Two gentlemen of elegant appearance in a state of bustitude. I, gave, <laughs> I give them coffee-colored crystals that should change their attitude. I'm using appropriate compression for my inappropriate confessions for someone. Oh I guess God, I... Anthony Kiedis, is that you? Is is that you singing? The thing is, like, right you, you're song? so right that the lyrics on this record are fucking terrible. Like Q-Tip's verse is awful. I mean, like Q-Tip's <laughs> verse to me is like everything that everyone Q-tip's I've ever verse seen who is like the everyone death who, of music. Everyone who I've ever seen like bag on Q-Tip for like, uh, you know, spiritual, miracle, lyrical hugs, not, I give lyrical (laughs) hugs, not drugs, shit, is here on this song. I mean, fucking um, Heidi Heidi Ho is a Callaway vibe when you're hip and you're clean and you ain't taking no jive. Speaking of jive, I think I was on that label. That was a long time ago. That was a fable. What the fuck is a fable? My dude? Do you do you realize, Q tip, that fables and things that happened in the past are not actually the same thing? So I, I think you might want to revise your writing work it's just, there for a moment. It's just terrible, now. terrible writing. Um, it, it's so it's so poorly written. I mean, it's like the the, 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 the inane funny. ramblings of an eight-year-old. Uh, I, and Jack White's not much better. Every time he's got a hook and he's like talking about fucking something, I'm just like, I will have to turn into fucking Charlie Day, Pepe Sylvia to find out what these songs are about. And it's just not worth wading through this swamp of fucking garbled ass guitar shit. It's just, God, I, I just, every, every yeah, time I, I listen there's to this, like, a, like a I general theme on this album theme in quotes 
there's there's a lot about like references to to the night and darkness like fear of the dawn essophobia into the twilight morning noon and night i mean i wish it meant anything admittedly it doesn't no oh it's, yeah it's, dusk. Fucking, it's fucking meaningless oh gosh the- <laughs> oh, into the twilight is one of the is another fucking garish song with the into the, the twilight, twilight. it reminded refrain. me of like, a, like a, a sample that you might hear in an avalanche's song except in just the most <laughs> awful context for it possible <laughs> yeah oh that's like that's a hilarious like you'd hear that in like the the left channel of like frontier psychiatrist yeah. what does that mean <laughs> I want to do that. The White like. Raven on here is a song that I swear to God you could set like a Gaspar Noé directed music video to, and then he just comes in with the a neutral piece comes from paint ten pieces. It's just <laughs> that's actually really not not that far off how it how no, it actually yeah. sounds on that song. I. <clears throat> So what's funny is that you're saying all of this stuff and like my opinion is literally just Chad Yes. <laughs> <laughs> look, if you look, deem this to be an look, acceptable look, look, look. 40 minutes of your time well spent, then I, good I on you. To say, I have to emphasize. Jesus Christ, it this is, album is mixed like dental tools. It's a begrudging Chad Yes. It's thin. I, there are moments here that don't work that I find painful to listen to, like Heidi Ho and Into the Twilight, for sure. Um, but there's just a, a sense of thorough ridiculousness to this that I just can't, I find so entertaining, to be perfectly honest. Like, uh, and <laughs> the lyrics are so bad on this album. I just want to quote Where some lyrics I? from the first track on this album, which incidentally is my second favorite song here, which is so funny considering what Jake said. Uh, <laughs> when you take out the figures and when you pull all the triggers, you're taking me back. When you listen to mystics as you lay at your picnics, you're taking me back. Uh, and my favorite little passage here, when you drop the mail off to me and make us both coffee, are you taking it black? Are you taking me back? <laughs> now, that, the, the, see, at least moments like that, I can kind of laugh at how ridiculous they are. Then let's go to one of my more preferred songs on the album. Uh, oh. That was Then This Is Now, which is, <clears throat> do you know where to go when you're walking around at midnight you can look high and low but you won't find yourself without a flashlight there are plenty <laughs> of ways to explain your situation when you're searching for love you have no time to be patient i looked all over town all around i didn't see you anywhere you were safe and sound underground Oof. where I couldn't see you at all. I found myself right at home on the shelf while you were busy looking for yourself there. That was then. And this is now. And now the time has come. There was a time when a boy would cry alone in his room in the corner, and it's a crime that his toys would turn to stone like their original owners. What? But that was then, and this is now. We all just figure it out somehow. Yes, we do. Ain't it true? Find yourself over the hill. Break your crown, Jack and Jill, in the open or underground. Are you making plans or just sounds? Looking up over at the moon, you can find yourself. But don't find it too soon. Don't find it too soon. Take your time, but don't find it too soon. What are you fucking talking about? Terrible, with the terrible God, lyrics. But come, come, come on! No one is going to a Jack White hopping on the lyricism. beat, kind of dripping off the meat grinder. <laughs> no one is going to a Jack White record for lyricism, and I, I, I feel like the no fact, one is. That's going... my fucking question, Riley. Why do they go to it then? Yeah, no one should go. He's to got a like Jack two guitar solos place. on here, and they both suck. They suck. Why do I like why the lyricism is bad? The production <laughs> can't even do the thing he's counted on to do. It's like going, it's it's like going into a fucking Jimi Hendrix concert when he was alive and just, and just being like, I don't fucking know, just like fucking listen to the drummer, I guess. Like <laughs> You know what? I I, I... 
I don't even like this record enough to argue with any of this. <laughs> yeah, just had a fun time listening to the brass sounding guitar sounds and Jack White being the most fucking deranged man on earth. His guitars sound like French horns having a seizure. It's so <laughs> You're killing me here. It's it's like a <laughs> like a marching band falling down a set of stairs. <laughs> Can we oh. talk about for a moment this album's album cover, which is not as aggressively <laughs> awful as Boarding House Reach, it, it, but it I find it to definitely me. hilarious the expression of what I assume is meant to be Jack on the front cover here looking at this disaster like, oh. <laughs> to me, the album cover looks like they couldn't afford the guy who does the covers for like street sects. So they got his like <laughs> brother. <laughs> I, I just, I can't get over blue hair Jack White. Like, you see photo, there's a press photo of him with blue hair and he's holding a guitar and he looks so fucking stupid. Like, he looks so f- fucking, I'll have to like edit it in on the video of this so you all can see, but it's just like, he, he is, I, I, I can't get the measure of Jack White anymore. I think he seems to be like, He's given me more and more evidence with each record that he's kind of self-aware of over everything he's doing and kind of the ridiculousness of it all. But at the same time, he, he does this while having this very this real sense of like, like he did a, a PSA a couple of weeks ago, like urging like uh, uh, labels to fund like uh, more vinyl printing factories and stuff and, and all this sort of stuff. Like he's, he's doing all this sort of like, um, you know, campaigning for like the purity of music to be like continued and for for it to be to not get swatted up in in the digital landscape and yet he's doing this music that kind of is the sort of thing that he's speaking out against which makes me think like is this meant to be like a kind of uh like a piss take or i don't know that's this is part of a double album let's not forget well the other half entering heaven alive we're getting we're getting later this year supposedly it's it's more of an acoustic record like it's more of a kind of like back to uh basics sort of sounding record so it's kind of supposed to be the inverse of this so we'll see how that pans out i am not don't have high hopes because again what i enjoy the most about jack white is when he's truly deranged like i said you don't come to jack white for the lyrics so i don't want a singer songwriter record from jack white but we'll see how it turns out i mean jack white we're we're gonna be friends is a good song and that's an acoustic little singer songwriter number but he also wrote it 20 years ago so whatever when he was 26 it's yeah. like coming to fucking kid cuddy for a fucking guitar solo like what <laughs> Why would I do that? Why would no, I want like, that? It's like going to Kid Cudi for rapping. Like, well, oh, <laughs> we, we all come to Kid Cudi for humming, even then. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You should, you know, You're that's what we should boy. get, actually. We should get an instrumental Kid Cudi album where he just hums. Well, to me, to me, and it's like, like, like that Snoop Dogg Book of Love album, and he just hums gospel <laughs> tunes for the whole thing. To me, thing. The, way, the way you've described Jack White's guitar tone on this record is actually what Kid Cudi's humming sounds like to me. I fucking hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> he just goes, oh. Oh, 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 oh. people are, and just fucking little, little fucking future sex offender boys are just sitting there stroking off like, Anyway, this is not a good eclectic, time. quirky, abstract, avant garde, introspective, chaotic, playful, rhythmic, dense, male vocal, mental, energetic, surreal, dark, nocturnal, noisy, manic, concept album. If these are turn ons for you, you should listen to the new Jack White album and come in your fucking pants. Yeah. You think you the in a cock, in a block, in a sock, no one, with a rock, in a jock, in a talk. You're wrong. At night, there is no light. I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. I'm right. I'm right. Truly one of the greatest musical minds of our generation. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we have experienced. <laughs> I love how this has just kind of turned into like uh, a kind of parallel to our Red Hot Chili Peppers segment last week. Uh, except, yeah. Except I I didn't like that record either. Anyway, let's do our favorite tra- 
<laughs> and I didn't listen to it. <laughs> Let's do our favorite tracks and ratings um, for 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 Jack Jack White's fear of of music. A blank, uh, blank, blank planet. planet. <laughs> Jack White's um, fear of a of a black fear of women. Fear of a black white. Uh, what? Fear of, fear of Jack Black. That's what it is. Fear of a, of a black Jack. My yes. least favorite song is Taking Me Back. My favorite song is Dusk because it's 20 seconds long. <laughs> In the words of the great Morgan D. Atley. <clears throat> Three! <laughs> oh, yes. All right. My, my favorite track on here tracks, uh, let's see, gotta be Into the Twilight. You know what? Yeah, it's going to be Into the Twilight. I'm going to have, uh, oh, what else? You know what? Yeah, Into the Twilight's one of my favorites. Great song. Uh, I love Esof- that Yuki Kajura song. Osophobia. And uh, Osophobia Reprise, also going to be my other two favorite songs. Uh, least favorite, it's going to be uh, Dusk. It was the shortest song, and I wanted this album to go on forever. It's, it's really my thing. It's a masterpiece. It's a modern classic. It's a t- four out of ten, baby! Round of applause. I want to imagine just because he has songs like Osophobia and just like the fear of the dawn. He's just the whole album is really just him singing like, oh, I'm scared of the boogeyman. My favorite tracks on this are uh, What's the Trick, uh, Taking Me Back, and Shedding My Velvet. My least favorite song is Heidi Ho. And uh, oh, your velvet. this <laughs> album gets a light six out of 10 from me which gives us an average of 4.3 for Jack White's Fear of the Dawn. Rest assured, it would be much lower if Morgan was here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine a universe where Morgan would listen to this. Morgan, M- Morgan would give this a, like a two maximum. <laughs> That he would he would go even lower than Jake. I if he had if he was having a particularly good day. Let us know at home what you think of either of the records we've discussed today. Father John Misty's Chloe in the Next 20th Century and Jack White's Fear of the Dawn. Did you like them more than we did? Did you hate them more than we did? What are your feelings? How do you think uh, the records shape up? What do you think of our thoughts on the records? Please let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple or your favorite podcast platform, consider heading over to YouTube by following the link in the description, uh, giving us a like, and subscribing to the YouTube channel, leaving a comment there if you want to, whatever you want to do, any of those things help us to be able to keep doing this. If you want to go above and beyond and truly become one of our besties, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page. And for just $1 a month, you can support the channel, get your name featured in the title crawl of every video on this channel, get priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us a record to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, though, August. Rock over London. Rock on Chicago. Taco Bell. Think outside the bun.